Welcome back, um, everyone, um, to the second of our uh, symposia this afternoon. Uh, we meet to explore some of the themes that shape thinking about the museum as a cultural and creative space, the themes that have shaped the great accomplishments of Glenn Lowry, our inaugural humanitas professor in museums, galleries, and libraries based at Balliol, um, a post made possible by the generosity of Mujan Majidi and Foster and Partners, to whom we are very grateful. The other participants today are Thomas Struth, who you've met already, and with him are two of the leading figures in the museum world, whom I shall introduce. Penelope Curtis is the director of Tate Britain, which is to say the greatest collection of British art on the planet, and she was <laughs> formerly the uh, curator of the Henry Moore Institute in Leeds, part of a wonderful legacy left by the greatest British sculptor. He, uh, she is a graduate of Oxford and the Courtauld, and she's published very li widely, including a masterful account of modernist sculpture in the Oxford History of Art, and a very beautiful monograph about Barbara Hepworth. Um, the most important critic of the modern age is the critic on the Amazon website, uh, and the <laughs> Amazon website person said, this book about Hepworth is so good, it's almost as good as going to St. Ives, which <laughs> is high praise. Um, Neil McGregor is director of the British Museum, and he was formerly director of the National Gallery. I won't bang on about it, but he's also an Oxford graduate um, and also a graduate of the Courtauld. He's been editor of the Burlington Magazine and is the author of many works, including the brilliant uh, History of the World in 100 Objects, uh, a book which accompanied the extremely successful Radio 4 series. Uh, I'm very grateful to them both for taking time out of a busy schedule to be here today to discuss our topic, which is the museum and the artist a very precise and narrowly defined topic, as you can see, uh, and we uh, haven't had much in the way of pre-discussion, so uh, um, <laughs> our panellists are, are going to be approaching this, I'm, I'm sure, in extremely different and diverse ways, uh, which is a good thing. Um, so what is the relationship between practising artists and the museum, and what should it be? Uh, in his lecture on Monday, uh, Glenn Lowry spoke very compellingly about the role of the contemporary art museum and explored some of the very fertile paradoxes that come about when you try to create an institution that is dedicated to the energies of disruption. There's a kind of a paradox at the heart of, of that kind of ambition which is very fertile and productive. But of course, as he also said on Monday, there are different sorts of museum and what kind of role might they have to play in the making of new art. Um, uh, 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 what is the principal mechanism by which they, they should set about doing so? Is it serendipity, or should it be somehow more planned? Uh, can you plan serendipity? Um, and how are the obligations that a museum might feel towards artists to be balanced or married with the obligations that they have towards other audiences, like the scholar, or the layman, or the student, or the child? Um, and what about art being created in a democracy? How do public institutions respond to those particular kinds of challenge? I've always been struck by a remark that Tocqueville makes in his masterpiece, Democracy in America. And he says that in aristocratic cultures, you get um, a small amount of great paintings. And in democratic cultures, you get a great amount of small paintings. <laughs> um, is that true? And if that is the nature of art in a democracy, what kind of role do public institutions like museums have to play in that, in the kind of balancing act between, as F.R. Levis puts it, on the one hand, mass culture, and on the other hand, minority civilization? Well, those are some of the questions that we might, or indeed might not, explore uh, this afternoon. So let me begin by asking uh, Glenn Lowry to speak, and then in order we'll, we'll listen to Thomas and Penelope and Neil, and then I'll open it up to questions uh, after that. Thank you so much, Seamus, and uh, just a quick word of, um, of just sheer delight to be sharing uh, uh, the afternoon, not only with Thomas again, but with Neil McGregor and, and Penelope, because they are two of the many great museum directors uh, that I think are doing such uh, remarkable work, and Neil in particular has been kind of uh, mentor and ideal for those of us uh, who've always thought about what it means to be a great director. So it's with a certain amount of humility that I offer a few words. And I want to focus um, on the Museum of Modern Art uh, as a kind of model and paradox for the question of the relationship between museums and artists. 
Museum of Modern Art was founded in 1929 by a group of uh, rather wealthy women who had decided that uh, the city of New York, being a new or relatively new city, poised uh, to become one of the great financial uh, centers in the world, needed an institution devoted to the most progressive uh, read avant-garde art of the day. They did not consult any living artists, uh, and indeed, initially, did not look at uh, a generation of artists who were still alive, but rather turned to a previous generation, uh, Cezanne and Van Gogh uh, and Seurat and Gauguin, as the precursors of the museum. And over the course of the first decades of the Museum of Modern Art, uh, the institution was shaped largely by their interests and the interests of the young Alfred Barr, uh, the inaugural director of the museum, and the other curators on the museum staff. Uh, and while they uh, relatively rapidly introduced the work of living artists, uh, first uh, Henri Matisse, then uh, perhaps surprisingly to many Diego Rivera, uh, and subsequently, uh, artists like uh, Picasso and Leger uh, and many others, they did not initially think of the museum as a place for artists. They thought of the museum as a place to present the art that they thought most pertinent. Uh, and the argument that um, I've tried to make about the notion of uh, museums of modern art, and I don't mean the museum of modern art, I mean uh, all museums of modern art, as disruptive institutions has to do with their commitment to a new kind of art uh, that, because it was current, did not require the same historical apparatus that art that was made centuries ago uh, requires. What has happened in those intervening years, uh, and in a way parallels my own trajectory, because I was trained as a curator of uh, medieval Islamic art, uh, where the idea of working with the artist uh, was fictive rather than anything else. Although if you've read uh, Orhan Pamuk's book, My Name is Red, it is in fact possible to bring to life uh, what it might have meant to be uh, a 16th or 17th century per, uh, painter in Iran or Turkey. But I was trained as a historian, uh, and the notion of thinking of the museum from the perspective of the artist uh, took me a very long time to get to, in the same way that uh, I think it's taken at least a place like the Museum of Modern Art a very long time to get to. And where we have arrived, perhaps together now, is the notion that if we want to remain disruptive, that is committed to the new, uh, and willing to challenge uh, our old and established orders, orders that we ourselves may have uh, been responsible for creating, there's only one way out of that box, uh, and it is to become an artist-centric institution to move the locus of the artist's principal interest from either its curatorial staff, that is its research staff, or its principal patrons, you can read trustees, or even the public, uh, and relocate it as first and foremost a place for artists, uh, which makes a lot of sense because everything we show is the result of someone having made it. Uh, and the majority of what we show is a result of someone who is still present with us having made it. Uh, and the ability to flip the conversation back to the maker and ask of the maker, what would you do? What's pertinent and interesting to you? What are your concerns? What are your desires? And what is it that we're doing that actually makes your skin crawl? Um, which is actually an important question to ask. Uh, and 
the way we got there, which is actually quite difficult, large institutions find it very hard to work with individuals, uh, not to mention individuals who might have very strong opinions, uh, not only about their own art, but about the art of, of others, was uh, in uh, 2000 to have merged with uh, PS1, which uh, is a contemporary art center, uh, not unlike uh, the modern art here in Oxford, uh, has no collection, uh, works only with uh, living artists. And we realized that if we wanted to refocus our, or in fact, intensify our interests on artists, we didn't actually have the expertise to do that. Uh, we needed to bring that expertise into the institution to, in a sense, um, infect ourselves, and I don't mean to use this in any other than a viral way, infect ourselves with the problem of working with artists on a regular basis. So the merger with uh, PS1, now known as MoMA PS1, uh, was in large part to find a way to bring artists, practicing artists, into the fold of the museum. Uh, and this is by no means something that ever is complete, but it has profoundly changed the way in which we think about the space of the museum, the kinds of exhibitions we're interested in doing, and the problems we set for ourselves. And let me um, just outline a few areas that have developed because we've started by saying to artists uh, on a regular basis, this is your place. You take responsibility for it. We are, we are there to work with you, but you have an ownership stake uh, in what we do and in how we do it. So uh, a couple of years ago, when we started talking to a number of artists and asking them, what is it that we're doing that we shouldn't be doing, and what is it that we should be doing that we're not doing, the whole question of uh, art in a global age came up. How do you deal with what's taking place in China, the Middle East, uh, Latin America, uh, to name but three uh, interesting uh, regions? And rather than, and, and, and all of which are, except for Latin America, not well represented either in our exhibition program or in our collections. And when we started talking to artists, what they said was, you've got to get involved. Uh, but don't get involved by talking to only to curators or even only to collectors. Get involved by talking to artists. Convene artist panels. Convene symposia. Bring artists into the research you would do uh, on these regions. Um, and so that's what we've done. We've created something called the Contemporary Modern Arts uh, Perspective, Art in the Global Age, that brings together curators, critics, and especially artists to talk about art from uh, different parts of the world, foregrounded, and again, this was something that came out of conversations with artists, foregrounded not in the region, not by saying, let's look at Japan, let's look at China, let's look at make up a country, but rather to take a problem, like the question of abstraction, or the question of performance, um, or the question of fluxus, and ask, how would artists in these regions explore, define, investigate, uh, and deal with these questions? So both in terms of opening our conversation to different parts of the world and opening the way we would discuss those parts of the world, uh, the relationship that we have um, engendered with artists uh, has been central to that conversation. And we're by no means unique, I would, I'm willing to bet that uh, if one asked colleagues at the Tate Modern or at the Centre Pompidou about the role of artists, they would, I believe, argue that they too rightly uh, endeavor to be artist-centric institutions. In our case, it's a real shift uh, whose repercussions uh, are yet to be fully felt. Uh, and its interest to me is the degree to which it makes us deeply uncomfortable. Uh, deeply uncomfortable uh, because artists uh, have such a complex relationship with the institution uh, and uh, over the years have railed against it, uh, have sought to be part of it, uh, and now have the opportunity to transform it. 
Uh, and, and we have just, again, as a result of um, conversations with a variety of artists, decided to create a series of fellowships at the museum uh, devoted to artists, uh, where they can elect to work in various departments of the museum for short or longer periods of time. And the idea is if, if we can create an institution that is saturated and suffused with the voice of artists in conservation, in the library, uh, in curatorial departments, it will ultimately profoundly alter the way in which we not only look at art, but the way in which we look at the relationship of our collection to our public and to the artists who are the creators of, uh, of the, the very objects that are at the center of our conversation. It's an iterative process. Uh, it's not something that uh, goes without uh, hitches. Uh, there are always bumps in the road. Uh, artists want to move faster than perhaps institutions can, uh, can move. But if we're successful, and this is uh, the key point I want to make, if we're successful, then we will no longer simply present a history of modern or contemporary art, whatever that might be, but we will present a lively debate about and with artists, and it's that conversation that will, I think, animate the way our public starts to think about the role of artists not only within the museum, but within society at large. And I think that's a very big issue for any museum because the role of the artist, uh, much as they are celebrated in, uh, in sort of the funny place of the auction room, for instance, but the role of the artist as a means of investigating society, the kind of thing that uh, Thomas's work does, I think is a central role to be uh, cherished and celebrated. And if we as museums can demonstrate at a very microscopic level that the voice of the artist is at the heart of what we do, it might take that voice outside the museum and bring it into a larger conversation in our society. Thank you. Um, I, I think what I would say is a bit uh, maybe shorter, I'm honored to, to, to share the panel with both of you, with all three of you, and I, uh, I, I want to, to just uh, raise some, uh, mention some aspects. I'm thankful for, to museums for, you know, for, for, for providing the space to look at original <coughs> work, uh, works of art. I had a particular, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm 56 now, when I was a young artist, uh, many museums I visited uh, were empty, as I mentioned already on Monday, and I had uh, the feeling, yeah, uh, yeah, like a shocking feeling of encountering works of art as if they were made, you know, not for me, but they were like, they were very, uh, very, very present. You know, that's much more d difficult to, to, to have today. Um, which, uh, which includes the question, what, is, what, is, what do museums do with their depots, and what do they show, and do they, if they would show less, would they, would they, would they be afraid that they, uh, that they would not express anymore how much they have? Uh, and I think if, you know, I always personally wish that, that, muse that museums would show much less because everybody knows what big depots they have, and so it would be more an expression of here's what we have and the best you know, air and and the best respect and the, be the best expansion we can do, and and that would uh, indicate the substance that's underneath will will be when they come next time will be of the similar quality. So that's one thing uh, I think. For an artist, um, at least for an artist of contemporary art, talking about museums of, of uh, visual arts, 
the museum is a kind of a future place. You, I mean, you're a person, then when you're interested in art, you maybe become a young artist, and then you eventually become a known artist, and eventually become a museum artist, where you think, okay, if my work is there, it will survive me eventually. You know, if it gets shown, you know, hopefully you never know about that. But, but it's one aspect you know, that is sort of, that is a guiding line uh, uh, on top of the gallery situation, you first of all, you need the galleries, you need space to exhibit it or, or something like that. At least when you're interested in making objects. Yesterday, uh, one of the, the, the postgraduate students uh, from Kenya, he, he's not, he was here before, but now I don't see him anymore. He, he, he's 47 years old and it took us like, like a half hour in the confrontation for me to realize that I'm so stuck to, to like invest in making a product, whereas he's totally not not interested in that. That was a very interesting experience for me. Uh, I'm I'm. Uh, uh, I often felt in the past 15 years or 20 years since art has become such a huge like you know, sort of swarm, swarm and cloud that's, that's practically everywhere. Uh, I, I, I sometimes was thinking, it, uh, art and artists, please, there's not placebos to, to apply on something that doesn't work well, so we put some art on it and it, and it looks better. <laughs> it looks better. We're not, we don't have to be so ashamed about what's underneath. Uh, I find that uh, uh, a thought that's quite important because it, 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 it has nothing to do with art in a, in a way. So the, the uh, differentiation of what, what, what holds and what's really meaningful and what should, be, should better not be done, is, uh, uh, I think it's important. Uh, I think in the art world and the arts, in the dealing with arts, there's a, there's a, the conflict of private and public is a, is a, is a big, big issue and even though uh, Mentors and you know, since the Medici, and I'm sure in other the emperors who's in China who supported artists and collected artists, this is all good. Uh, but I'm uh, I'm I'm skeptical when the public domain withdraws from from art because it's another signal of of, of lowering the, the the significance of of a community. Um, and then I think which is valid for all, you know, for some of what I said before, that the question is always, uh, like, do you head a movement or do you uh, create a new thing? You know, do, do, you, do you plan, you do you see, do you have a future vision and you, you initiate uh, a certain change that could also be a model you know, of, of, of treatment, of, of, of activity in general, or, or are you being, you're being headed by the, are you just reacting, you know, on internet, cell phone, picture making? You know, do you say, okay, we 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 think, you know, the the world is going in in that direction, but but uh, part of the resume or what we can take of that is is another thing. Uh, we uh, uh, demonstrate like another aspect. <clears throat> yeah, then one, one thing that, I, that, we, that we discussed and I several times, uh, how do you measure the quality of a visit? Like you say, oh, five million visitors. You take modern, great, fantastic. You, you have five million people going up, up and down uh, the escalators, but do you have an idea? I mean, when I'm there, I have deep respect for you know, for 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 what they did and what they're doing, but the question for me is, uh, I see hundreds and thousands of people there who are just walking by the art wall. Work it's just like a strolling on a Saturday uh, uh, afternoon, except they cannot buy anything. <laughs> <laughs> they can, they can. <laughs> but so you know, th these are some of the questions. That I'm uh, um, that are that are in my head uh, when I think about the museum. <laughs> um, 
I've got some pictures, so maybe you could um, turn the lights down. Um, I've only been a, a director of a museum for one year, so um, I mean August Company, um, and I guess I'm therefore very much engaged in thinking about what is Tate Britain, which is it is itself a, an old and a new creation, um, and I think the fact that it is a museum of British art means that we very much have a primary audience of British artists who are the artists around us, especially in London, given that so many artists come to study, live and work in London. So in a way, what Len was talking about in relation to a museum for artists is what Tate Britain has to be, because we are the museum of British art or British artists. And I suppose in thinking about this topic and how to try to narrow it down in some kind of meaningful way. Um, one of my thoughts has been, are we a museum of or for artists? And can we be a museum of artists, of many artists, for the individual artist? And I think much of what I've been involved with thinking about in the last year is how to be a museum and to be a good museum and not to want to be a Kunsthalle or a project space or an artist space to let ourselves be a museum and to be comfortable with being a museum. Obviously, we've become, I think, over the last 20 years, quite used to seeing different kinds of interventions um, and used to seeing how artists use the language of museums to make work. So in the 90s, for example, works by Damien Hirst or Mark Dion or Susan Hiller, which have very much taken on the, a kind of simulacrum or even a pastiche of the museum language of the taxon taxonomic um, arrangement, the physical form of a collection and how it's organized. And we've seen that over and over again. And it goes back in many ways to work, seminal works by artists such as Marcel Brutters from the 1970s. And I think we've become perhaps rather used to that. A little more recently, we've seen artists such as Simon Starling go into the archive of the museum to explore the museum's own history and make a different kind of simulacrum to represent a museum as it had been presented 70 years ago, in this case, the Folk Van Museum in Essen. Uh, so it's a, a near simulacrum, an almost perfect repeat of the museum in its own space. And I've, I've been thinking about the difference between uh, artists looking at the arrangement of a collection, the, f the form of the collection and how it's presented, and on the other hand, how artists relate to the building, the building itself, and to what extent that is some kind of attack on the institution. So to a degree, you might say that Fiona Banner's recent intervention in the Devines Gallery in Tate Britain, although a, a soft attack, is a kind of attack on the, the nature of the very building. And it's interesting how a number of recent projects, and even just looking at the Tate itself, we can look at that kind of sense of uh, a kind of assault, almost literal physical assault on the building. So the project, for example, that Richard Serra did in Tate as it was the Tate Gallery in 92, shown on the left there, still, we still have the marks of that project on the floor. Um, and unless we totally relayed the floor, those marks won't go away. There is a kind of a bruise um, of some of these very uh, distinctive art projects. And perhaps the best example of that is the project by Doris Salcedo in Tate Modern, in which I think she literally wanted to um, attack the museum as a building. And those scars are still um, very much there on the ground. But I think perhaps we are moving away from that kind of intervention, where either, either the pastiche of the museum or the intervention, the kind of direct intervention into the space of the museum. 
maybe we are going back in time to a degree, looking more at a kind of art making as a sense of a continuum or as a conversation. I, th I think we're moving from something that is the confrontation to the, something that is more conversational. And that means actually coming back to the content of the museum and its collection. So here we have Samuel Morse's well-known picture from 1831 of Copius in the Louvre. But I thought I might put that alongside a picture. This was suggested to me by Neil, actually, um, of an exhibition that I did with Keith Wilson, who's here in the audience, um, in the Royal Academy on modern British sculpture. And we began our exhibition with a conversation between works from the past from the British Museum and works from the early 20th century by modern artists. And I think one of the things that we wanted to do here and is perhaps novel was to make a virtue of the pluralistic nature of a conversation and how artists pick things up from museums, perhaps indirectly, even unconsciously. And it's not a one-to-one, -one, it's very much the a number of sources will feed into an artist's sense of language and form. So this is really about the experience of the museum by the artist. And I suppose we tried to imagine what it might have been like to walk around the British Museum in the 1920s and to have artwork open around you. And often artwork that you didn't understand, but that you were impressed by. So I think that knowledge, that sense of incomprehension is important. And that was maybe, to a degree, something we wanted to bring out in this room, a kind of not knowing being as important as knowing. Um, and another way we looked at that um, in the Royal Academy was this room, which, whereas the previous room had been very much about... I can't go backward. Oh, oh. The previous room was very much about figuration. This room was much more about abstraction and how different kinds of forms and medias um, from other cultures can allow things to happen in your own culture. And one of the things that has certainly impressed me as I've been working in Tate Britain for the last year is talking with artists um, who are in the collection themselves about their early experiences of uh, coming to the museum. So, for example, often the results are unexpected and very indirect. So a work, for example, like this by Kerith Wynne Evans from 2000 um, he talks about how important the Tate was for him as a young boy coming from Wales and how he loved to go to the Rothko room and this was the, the art experience that was most important for him and which he wanted to return to again and again and again. And there for me there's an interesting possibility opening up I think in terms of thinking about British artists and their experience of non-British art and how we might think about Tate Britain as a container which can be opened up a little bit more widely but then, of course, we have the problem of the impossibility of the museum in relation to art. And my example here, um, again, relates to the show at the Royal Academy. Thinking about the wall that Kurt Schwitters made in the Lake District in England at the end of his life, this Mertz Barn wall, which was later salvaged, saved by Richard Hamilton and others um, from the University of Newcastle and transferred to the Hatton Gallery, where it now is in a rather um, sad way because it can't be the artwork that it was um, and the translocation is not really so successful. So we thought of Schwitters in another way rather than translocating the art, we thought of translocating the building itself and thinking about the container within the container putting the Schwitter's hut in the grand courtyard of the Royal Academy, the spaces where artists live and make work and allow their work to be shown and thought of. And how, you know, how museums can give artworks or give activities different kind of lives is obviously endlessly fascinating. One example which I thought of in relation to Tate Britain and its recent history is the example of Brian Hawes' a demonstration in Parliament Square in Westminster in London, which was translocated by Mark Wallinger, who is also here in the audience, and I hadn't expected him to be, so I've apologised already for <laughs> this photograph. Here is Mark with um, 
the, as it were, the rendition of Brian Hawes' work from Parliament Square in the Tate. And why I've put this in is because it, in a way, links again to the Richard Serra and to the Doris Salcedo, but in a, a different way. But still we bear this trace, this mark, this line, which was the um, demarcation line um, set up uh, around the demonstration area, the performance area, um, ran through the Tate, and M Mark laid the line through the ground of the Tate, and the line, although it's been removed, is still there. So as we walk through our historic galleries, we still have this line uh, laid by Mark Wallinger uh, four years ago, which I, I quite like. People often say to me, what's that line? Um, it seems strange to me that the Tate hasn't tried harder to get rid of it. Um, maybe they like this trace of a, of a previous presentation. So here's a work that which we have in the collection, which I think is quite um, nice for this moment. This is a photograph by the artist Keith Arnott from the 70s. And this is Keith Arnott, the artist, walking up the steps of the Tate. So this is the artist and the museum, the artist with the museum, a museum which he as an artist could be in. So it's interesting to me to think about how an artist experiences the museum. The, another work by him, which perhaps is the kind of obverse um, from 1970, is the artist without the museum. So I suppose I'm feeling at the moment after a great deal of activity in Britain in which, in which different kinds of institutions and different kinds of museums, very often not the art museum, but the British Museum or the Natural History Museum or Maritime Museum, have used artists to try and um, stimulate interest in collections um, in different ways with greater or lesser degrees of success. I think I'm more interested now in trying to find the, the continuum and the coherence of an artistic tradition um, I think I would like to be as concerned as Glenn is about bringing artists into that discussion, but rather than looking for a rhetoric of disjunction or even uh, intervention, looking more for a, a rhetoric of, of continuity and conversation, so that perhaps you know, rather than looking for the unexpected in the museum, I think there is a lot to be said for what is expected about the museum, what we want to find there, and want to find there again, and want to find looking good. So I think what I have to look for in the work I'm doing in the next few years is seeking that balance of continuity and change, making sure that we are talking to artists, but not necessarily thinking about how those artists are shown themselves, but providing them a museological experience that is relevant, pertinent, and beautiful, um, as relevant to the artists as also to our public. But I certainly do see that our primary audience, especially for a gallery like Tate Britain, would be the British artists who surround us. So maybe, therefore, it's a finding a combination of those visible confrontations with the invisible conversations between the past and the present. I was very, like as Penelope said, when we were asked to come to talk about uh, the museum and the artists, we both rather nervously said, could you give us a little more precision or some idea of what we're talking about, um, what aspect? Uh, Seamus was very robust and said, no, 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 it wanted to be free-ranging and wide, and then started throwing in words like democracy, Tocqueville, whatever. Um, <laughs> so in a kind of vertigo of uncertainty... Um, uh, Penelope and I prepared um, our talks. So I'm not really clear how any of this is going to fit to what uh, has been said, maybe said, by Thomas or by Glenn or by Penelope. But I want to start from a different position because the British Museum is, of course, not an art museum. It's a museum uh, of things about society, talk about society. But I think it is a museum in which, of course, great works of art exist and from which have been created. I think it's a good context in which to think about the ways in which museums subvert artists' intentions 
um, or invite artists to subvert their own intentions or other artists' intentions. Um, and I want to begin with the, uh, the fact that's the, the very beginning of the story of what we make. Um, what the museum, the power of the museum to decide whether something is art or not is, of course, one of the uh, banalities of all museology courses. But it is, I think, very striking um, when you start looking at the very first things made. This, of course, is one of the oldest chopping tools ever, about 1.8 million. This is why we are all here today, of course, because it's what lets us scavenge the meat and get to the protein um, and grow brains or whatever. Um, it's the ideal uh, chopping tool. But very quickly, um, uh, and still about one and a half million years ago, we stopped making them like this, which is all we need to do to, make a, to get what we want, and start making them like this. Beautifully symmetrical, carefully shaped, much harder to make, probably too big to use, but clearly beautiful. And these, I think, are quite clearly sculptures. And you can trace, as you go along the uh, layers in the Rift Valley in Tanzania, the speed with which we stop making things that are useful um, only and start making them less useful but more beautiful. Um, again, slightly later, about one and a half million years ago, another chopping tool but made out of extraordinarily difficult to handle uh, pink quartz fetched from miles and miles away, much less good for stripping uh, an elephant, um, but clearly much more beautiful. It's the museum, if we present these as sculptures, what we found very fascinating, if we present these as works of art, the response of the public is entirely different from presenting them simply as uh, chopping tools. And it does, I think, raise the question of whether every one of us uh, well, it makes it clear we are all hardwired to be artists, to make complexity, to do things more complicated than necessary. And that from the very beginning, of one and a half million years ago, we have an aesthetic hardwiring drive that is an essential part of our existence. I wanted to uh, pay a quick homage to Penelope, who's fled, of course, um, uh, uh, to, to the, the notion of the, uh, what art is, what the museums allow. Once the more conventional works of art are exhibited as works of art, um, the, this is the, the great Egyptian uh, husband and wife tomb sculpture from Saqqara that Henry Moore was so inspired by. Um, then, of course, the, the standard development that we all know, the art historical tracings of source and whatever, become much easier. But it also works the other way, as well as the homage to works like this, there's also the revolt against. And um, I think one of the most striking examples of that recently with us has been uh, in, uh, the decision by Mark Quinn to put beside this, uh, this is a Roman copy of uh, Crouching Venus, as you know, uh, wonderful study in concealed beauty. Whichever way you stand, you can't actually see what it is you actually want to look at. Um, and it's quite clear that the, the game is this very complicated tease, and Mark Quinn chose to put right beside it, of course, um, uh, a, more, uh, a more contemporary notion, uh, and perhaps a more instant notion of delight and pleasure. But it's a way, of course, of responding, different kind of filiation, but nonetheless a powerful one. But Mark Quinn also, I think, demonstrated something very interesting in another response to the sculptures in the British Museum, to the most famous sculptures of all, of course, the Parthenon sculptures. As you know, when these arrived in London, they were the first, effectively, the first real ancient Greek sculptures ever to be seen in Western Europe, uh, hence the sensation. They were... Uh, treated unlike any other previous sculptures by the trustees. They were the first sculptures, as far as I know, ever to be put on show in a public place, not restored. Uh, all previous 18th century, early 19th century collectors, uh, owners, put on the lost heads, arms, bodies, whatever. These sculptures uniquely were shown uh, in their mutilated, broken shape uh, because nobody wanted to touch the vital achievements of the original sculptors. An extraordinary homage of the museum to the artist. And I think the first, a very important moment, I think, in that humility of the museum in face of the artist. It was meant, of course, to insist on letting us see what could survive of that great aesthetic uh, of Greek sculpture. And it is, I think, an extraordinary 
interesting subversion of the original artist's intentions, who would, of course, have been appalled to see their work shown like this. But, as you, many of you know, of course, it was these sculptures that particularly inspired Mark Quinn's Alice in Lapin, who was determined to see in the Greek sculptures the beauty of disability, the beauty of a body not conventionally beauty, beautiful, to deny the absolutely fundamental founding aesthetic of uh, Greek culture, the equivalence of physical beauty with moral beauty, and to insist publicly on the beauty of uh, a, a body uh, shaped by the thalidomide drug. And its power, I think, of, that, of the subversion of the intention and the fact that the display can be read in so many different ways that is, I think, one of the great values of the museum, that the object once out is uncontrolled. I want to stay with this for a moment because the question of whether the original artist should be able to control how the work is shown and how it's read is, of course, a very fundamental thing now. Uh, the Greek artist, I say, I think, would have been appalled but the power of artists to determine that is, I think, a very questionable uh, issue. It's most striking in the National Gallery, uh, in the, that strange quartet of pictures, um, the two paintings by Turner, Mist Rising Through Vapour and Died of Founding Carthage, which he left to the National Gallery uh, on his death, along with, uh, on one condition, uh, the condition that they must in perpetuity hang between these two paintings by Claude Lorraine. It's the only hanging constraint that the trustees of the National Gallery ever accepted. But it is, I think, worth asking whether we really think this is proper for an artist for the rest of time <laughs> to insist. I think it was very unwise of Turner, I have to say. Um, uh, I don't think the comparison does him any uh, good at all. But... It is actually very interesting. We hear a great deal about the rights of artists, copyrights, whatever. The extraordinary thing is that nobody questions, it seems to me, the preposterous right of dead artists to control what happens to their work and how Claude and Turner, these are ever to be shown. It means, of course, they can never be put in the context of national schools. There are own national schools. Uh, it means lending them is fantastically difficult. When the Tate wanted to borrow the Turners, we had to say, would you like the Claudes as well? Um, <laughs> or else this zealous group of people called the Overturners who fight to defend the rights of the dead Turner um, would have taken somebody to court with some sanction, not quite known. This is where the Art of the Museum, I think, becomes really interesting. What are the... I mean, uh, Glenn said how difficult it is dealing with living artists. Dead artists are far more complicated when they do this kind of thing. And the power of the dead to limit the enjoyment of the living is, <laughs> is one of the bases on which our whole museum culture is predicated in the Western world. Uh, Rubens, at the end of his life, painted two sublime landscapes. Um, uh, when he'd moved to retirement at the Chateau of Hetstein outside Brussels, his two great reflections on life and the world. They were meant to be, the pendants, they were meant to be seen together. You will never see them together other than on this slide. The one at the bottom is, of course, in the National Gallery and can be lent. The one at the top had the misfortune of passing momentarily into the possession of Lady Wallace, who, when she left it to the nation at the end of her life around 1900, stipulated that it should never be separated from the other works in the Wallace collection, nor should any works from elsewhere be mixed with the works in the Wallace collection. Uh, we are in perpetuity forbidden from seeing what Rubens wanted us to see by the way we structure our museums. Um, just a thought, but I think it's quite an interesting one. And it is... Uh, one that recurs in British museums very little, because trustees were very rigorous about this, um, in continental museums very much indeed. I want to finish just with a brief series of questions about the museum as a public national body and the role of artists choosing or not choosing to play a part in that. And 
we hear a great deal, of course, the tradition is that the artist is the contester, the attacker of the political consensus. I think it's very interesting that in some cases it's quite the reverse. And I want just to look a little bit at the phenomenon of Australia, where the huge social, political, ethical challenge of the last 40 years has been finding some kind of dialogue, some kind of reconciliation between the Aboriginal population and the European settlers. And in that, the artist in the museum has played a very, very remarkable part. So, as you all know, the development of uh, the uh, portable Aboriginal art tradition, but it has been very much mediated through the museums in Australia as part of a process of national reconciliation. Um, this is a work by Banduk Marika um, uh, from Arnhem Land, showing the origins of the world, her world, her tribal view of the world, the ancestor lizards uh, on either side. And the museum, again, doing this extraordinary, playing this extraordinary role in national life, that she was commissioned by the National Gallery of Australia, and she was the first trustee uh, of the National Gallery of Aboriginal Descent. Again, the role of the boards of these museums with artists in playing this part. Uniquely, Australia, of course, was colonized. The Aboriginals were dispossessed by people who never wanted to go there in the first place. Um, it's, the, it's what makes it the uh, very unusual colonial experience um, <laughs> that most of them were deported. So the significance of, select, of demonstrating this, the last deportation to Australia um, it's not very widely known in this country, it was actually in 1940, when German refugees, thought to be enemy aliens, were forcibly and brutally transported to Australia, including uh, Ludwig Hirschfeld Mack, who taught at um, Bauhaus and was sent off and imprisoned in Australia for two years in effectively a, a concentration camp. Um, and this is his image of himself in Australia looking at the Southern Cross. Um, collected very consciously by Australian museums to put beside the Aboriginal works and to make the narrative of the whole nation through the museum, through the artists. And it's a theme that has been very much developed. Um, this is an early, uh, an early Aboriginal work about life and death from tribal traditions. Um, again, trying to bring these traditions into the European mainstream put beside um, a work by uh, an artist who was dying of AIDS, um, David McDermott, um, 1994, um, bringing life and death and people who excluded from the community into the tradition. It is, I think, a very interesting role. I mean, can the museum and the artist, should they properly be part of this kind of social exploration of a national identity? with a very coherent aim that we want to be one. Um, is this a political engagement of the artist? It's one of the roles that museums around the world have taken on, the National Museum exploring the national identity. And it's a topic that is of burning importance at the moment, as you know, in China. Um, and I just want to finish with a work by Xu Bing, um, a contemporary and great friend, once of Ai Weiwei, uh, who is going to be shown at the British Museum next week, Ai Weiwei's work at the Tate Union closed last weekend. And the two artists together raise this extraordinary set of questions about the artist, the museum, and the world today. And the museum as the role in which those issues are now dramatically uh, played out. What your Shu Bing does is responses to uh, traditional Chinese uh, landscape painting in ink. You can see uh, one of his earlier works um, with the work from which it was derived um, on the right. But these are not uh, pen and ink uh, works. They're, they're not uh, ink paintings. They are, in fact, uh, light boxes with assemblages of uh, debris, corn husks, fibre, whatever, behind. So that when you go back around the front, you, uh, you uh, have a different appearance. 
This has become a very important set of political questions in China, and where Ai Weiwei is, of course, in direct confrontation with the, uh, with the authorities, Shu being the director of the Central Academy of Art, taking this much more nuanced view of what is the tradition, what is it really about, what is it made of, what, when you look closely, does it turn out to be? Um, is this uh, political art? Is it not? Uh, it is, I think, one of the key areas now for the artist and the museum, these fundamental questions of what a nation wants to be that the contemporary art is, is playing out in the museum. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you uh, very much to all four of our participants who raised, uh, rose magnificently to the uh, inspired vagueness of the title that we gave them. Time is very much against us, I'm afraid, but perhaps we might have time for two, one or two quick, quick questions. If they're right. Yes. Could you speak into the microphone so we can pick up your voice on the recording? Um, I live in Los Angeles, and I'm just curious how much of a voice you're willing to give to the artist, because uh, recently our local Museum of Contemporary Art, MOCA, um, had an incident where the director painted over a wall mural that an artist who had been invited to paint uh, because he thought it was going to offend the neighborhood. So I'm just curious and just, you speak about bringing the artist in and giving the artist voice and I'm just curious on what degree of voice and participation. Are you addressing that to me? To anyone in general, yes, to you, you were speaking of it. Uh, I'll certainly uh, be happy to give a response. I mean, it was an interesting incident because uh, the artist was actually commissioned and paid for by the director. Right. Uh, so he felt that he had uh, the license, in a way, uh, to remove the work of art. I think, actually, what's interesting about um, inviting artists, as it were, to be uh, at the heart of the institution is the fact that you're going to find yourself as an institution in difficult situations, that you'll have to negotiate both with artists and your public, uh, and, uh, and the neighborhood for that matter. Uh, so without going into whatever rationale um, Jeffrey Deitch might or might not have had in uh, removing the mural, what I think was important was that it caused an event to happen. Uh, I Personally, I think once you make a decision to invite an artist to do something, you, you live with it, uh, painful as it may be. Uh, you have a choice. You don't actually have to invite someone to do that. But once they do it, uh, I think you have, you know, there are circumstances under which you, you have a commitment to that artist. I have no idea what the d dialogue or the discussion was between uh, the director and the artist, uh, whether the artist was comfortable with the mural coming down. Uh, but my own position is, once you make a decision to go forward, uh, then you have to go all the way uh, until, uh, until it's over. And, and sometimes that's confrontational. Uh, that's part of being involved uh, with what I would call disruptive situations. And I'm not only about disruption, but I think it animates the conversation that you can have both within and outside the institution. Okay, very reluctantly, I think we probably do need to end there as it's getting close to five to seven. So can I call upon Sally, Professor Sally Shuttleworth, who's head of the Humanities Division here at Oxford to come and wrap things up with thanks. Sally, over to you. So these two uh, chairs and uh, the events of this week have been part of the Humanitas programme. Humanitas programme 
grew out of a conversation I had with Lord Weidenfeld saying what in these difficult times could you do for humanities and what we have had the great pleasure to experience this week is part of the triumphant result. The vision was what would happen if you could bring world-leading figures from arts, culture and the intellect to Oxford. And we have had the great, great pleasure this week of experiencing what can be possible. It has been, I think, a red letter week for Oxford. These have been the inaugural chairs for contemporary art and for museums, libraries and galleries. And I think it's going to be very difficult for the people next year to live up to the, uh, the wonderful standard achieved this year. So I'd like to renew thanks to Lord and Lady Foster and also, also to Ms. Anne G.D. from Foster and Partners for all their wonderful support in, in helping um, bring this to be. Also to participants today, to Michael and James, to Penelope and Neil, but most particularly to our uh, two chairs of this week, Thomas Struth and uh, Glenn Lowry. Now, Thomas uh, spoke earlier in the week about his, his aim in trying to sharpen the observer's eye. I think we can say that both our eyes and our, our minds have been sharpened from the experience of this week. But finally, I'd like to thank Lord Weidenfeld for his vision, and I look forward to the grand plans he might have for Oxford in the future. Now, um, there will be a, a reception afterwards, but because we're short of time, could I ask those who are actually going to uh, Magdalen to um, go straight to the coaches, which are turn left out of the building and then left again, and it's an orange one. So, will you join me in thanking both our sponsors, our speakers, and all involved for putting on such a wonderful week? <laughs>